one of the things that I, I did because I wasn't, I think, being super mindful of where I was pulling from was I started overcompensating and really playing, like, tensing my forearm. And I showed up to physical therapy one day and my forearm was literally swollen, like visibly swollen. I had a great time connecting with today's guest. She just finished her freshman year at the New England Conservatory and has started a podcast. I'm Jason Heath. This is Controversy Conversations. We're talking today with Alyssa Peterson, who was recommended to me by my friend and colleague and team member here on the podcast, Trevor Jones. He said, you got to get in touch with Alyssa. She's doing great things. And she is. It's super cool. She hails from La Crosse, Wisconsin, and she spent the past year not only at NEC, but also starting the podcast Something to Consider College Edition. And she gets into all sorts of cool topics on that. We talk about this, the pandemic, how that's been for her, her goals for starting a podcast, why a podcast, the importance of self-care for musicians and how she covers that in the podcast and much more. We've got the podcast linked up and her Instagram page. Definitely be sure to check her out. And before we get rolling here, I've got a promo for my friend and now fellow podcaster, lots of podcast talk today, Andrew Harmon. He's a bassist and does many other things in Portland, Oregon, and his podcast is called Citizens of Jobland. So here's a promo, and then we will get into our conversation with Alyssa. Who exactly is an essential worker? From full-time employees to part-timers, temps, freelancers, and members of the gig economy, they're all the subject of Citizens of Jobland, a new podcast launching this summer. The show explores jobs you may never have heard of, non-traditional career paths, and compelling journeys to success. We'll talk to everyday exceptional people about what they do, the doors that open for them, advice for job seekers, and much more. So instead of asking who is an essential worker, Citizens of Jobland says, well, who isn't? <laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Good. I was just listening to your podcast with Trevor. So it's so weird oh. to like hear your voice. That was just <laughs> so... <laughs> so are you, I'm assuming you're home right now, not yeah. in, but okay. You're from, where are you? You're from Wisconsin, you said. Yeah. Where, where yeah. in Wisconsin? I'm in La Crosse right now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. That's great. Um, so I'm I'm from a uh, slightly bigger town, but not much. I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So I I drove through La Crosse many, 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 many times, driving oh, yeah. back from <laughs> Northwestern to South Dakota and that kind of thing. Okay. It's a, a, it's a cute little place. I don't know. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful... I think it, it might be different because that's where you're from, but I've just uh, totally been enchanted with that part of the country. I think it's called the Driftless Zone, if yeah. I remember right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because um, we would sometimes, just to change it up, we'd drive through Galena, Illinois, which is part of that hole in like mm -hmm. Dubuque, Iowa and everything. And it's so interesting because it's, it's just so uh, unlike the rest of the Midwest. Yeah, for sure. No, um... We live in a different house now, but when we first moved here, our backyard, we didn't have a yard. We had the bluffs. Okay. Like that wow. was <laughs> that was our yard was oh, the... Uh, the bluffs. So it was yeah, it's it's definitely super cool. <laughs> it it's yeah, it's it's totally. I love Wisconsin. I've had such a great time there. I used to teach at UW Whitewater for mm -hmm. like five, six, seven years maybe or something. Actually, it was kind of a long time. And it spent a lot of time on that. On, and then I yeah. played a lot in Milwaukee. And I, I think 15 years I played up in Door County. So like opposite end of the state. But um, yeah. I, have, I have fond memories of Wisconsin. Not so fond memories of the winter in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part nobody nobody likes Wisconsin winters. They're brutal. No, it was it was really funny because um, we're used to just getting piles piles of snow and ice, and school still won't be canceled. Yep. I remember I went to tour NEC and Boston Conservatory in like March, and they got like this much snow, and they canceled everything. I was like, this is nothing. This is nothing. Oh wow! I was it I was, was curious. hilarious. Well, I was curious about that because if people complain so bitterly about Boston winters, and I'm ashamed to say I've spent zero time in Boston. I've just weirdly <sighs> never been there in my life. But coming from where I know winter is a real thing, so uh, Wisconsin winters t take the take the prize yeah. in terms of nastiness. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, there, I, I yeah, I just don't think. 
Boston winters are that bad. They might be more like wet and slushy, so mm-hmm. things are more slippery. But I don't know. I still think Wisconsin is worse. <laughs> yeah, I think Wisconsin, Minnesota, that eastern part of the Dakotas where I'm from, that's a that's a whole different level of pain. I felt like oh, I was yeah. moving to a temperate climate, moving to Chicago, and people complain about the winters there too. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was better, you know. I think I think that the snow uh, melted probably three four weeks earlier in Chicago, fell mm-hmm. three four weeks. So it, it's and I mean it's not. Now I live in San Francisco, and I'm, I've become completely soft, and I can't I can't even conceive of like the. I think the first time I went into a th- like a 32 degree climate or something like that, I freaked out because I, I just my body's not I'm like, used What's to it. Happening? <laughs> but it never gets warm. Like I, I'm I'm wearing my pullover because it's I think what is it 56 degrees and cloudy right now. So that's really? just like yeah, San Francisco is this weird little microclimate because it's sitting in the Pacific Ocean, mm-hmm. and so you get it just stays incredibly stable throughout the year. It's always between 50 and 70. Which is very nice, you know. We got yeah, our palm, I was palm say, trees. Man, and, I don't yeah. complain about that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's like, could... <laughs> it's it's been like ninety and humid for the past like three weeks, and mm-hmm. it's kind of miserable. <laughs> Yeah, there's something I, I mean, I, I probably would get sick of it if I was in that all the time. But I do sort of like that heat now that I'm I'm just always used to being like we can trade places. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe for a week right now, maybe not in the winter. But <laughs> it, it, it is weird to get just get used to being slightly chilly all the time. Like there are not a lot of suntans in San Francisco. It's, oh, it's see, I would love that. I'm a sweatshirt kind of gal. The more layers the happier I am. So <laughs> I don't know. Winter, winter isn't that terrible for me. I'm like, this is pretty comfy. I kind of like this. That's great. That's great. Well, Hey, there's always grad school and beyond. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll see you out here. It's a, it's a special place, not an affordable place, but neither is Boston actually. No. So yeah, no, Boston is pretty, Whew. it's all pretty pricey. It, it's all pretty pricey actually. Yeah. I know. I hey, I love the podcast. That's what, and by the way, I guess Thank maybe you. I guess maybe we're going. I don't really I don't really do an official intro or anything on these anymore. But if you want to, Ed, I mean, you're a fellow podcaster now, so you're probably comfortable with doing this. But if there's anything you want to edit out, just just say the word. It's not live in the slightest. So. Got it. Got it. <laughs> and so I I, ha- I I love talking to people who do a podcast, which I don't get to do very often because there aren't uh, that. So. Uh, why I'm curious why uh, because I asked myself this too like why a podcast of all the things you could be doing like what attracted you to to that um so we listen to a lot of podcasts in my household there's pretty much always a podcast playing and so I think pretty naturally I was drawn to that sort of medium um I'm not like YouTube, I don't know, sitting in front of a camera mm-hmm. is a whole different type of experience that I don't know that I want um, versus, I mean, sitting in front of a microphone is also kind of weird, um, but not. So I think a podcast, you still reach a wider audience, but I don't know. It's just your voice. I feel like there's a little less, little less pressure that goes into that. I, I think so. Well, my sort of rule of thumb is uh, v- doing a podcast takes about 10 times the amount of work as like writing a blog post. That might not be completely true because I spend a lot of time writing. And then video takes 10 times the work of doing a podcast, I think. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, oh, my lighting's <laughs> terrible. Oh, this is weird. Oh, I don't like the way I look at that. And so, mm-hmm. um, and I don't know, there's something that it, it, this sort of, especially like the, well, any length of podcast really, but I, I think, I think especially so maybe for the longer form things, like what you're chat with Trevor like it just sort of lends itself to insightful conversations I mean I watch a lot of YouTube like like a lot of people too but it's I consume it in a very different (laughs) way right like I was I was just on my run this morning and I was listening to a podcast and that got done and then I put on another one so I'm like and it feels like you're kind of there with the person yeah like like you're a third person in the room yeah it's it's a a little more intimate because you're not having to like stare at a screen you can like still go about your life and and listen to a conversation and have those moments of, huh, I'd never thought about that. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I love it. It's great. Yeah, hope you keep it up. It's really cool. And I love one thing you're doing right off the bat. And I, I, it's so cool. I, I don't know why I don't do this, but you've got these surveys. You're put, you're yeah. surveying people <laughs> and you're incorporating. That is such a cool idea. Uh, where where did you uh, where, where how did that uh, come to mind? So. My dad and I have, as I said, he's an avid podcast consumer. So um, he's got a very like, this is what makes for a good podcast. This is what kind of turns me off from podcasts. And he listens to a very wide variety of, of podcasts. And one of the things that I wanted to do was obviously provide some advice, some insight, some points of consideration for anybody going into college or that's already in college. But I have a very limited viewpoint going to a conservatory, and I didn't want to speak to only music students. And so my dad suggested that, you know, I either put together like a formal survey or I just kind of ask other like university friends that I have so that I'm getting sort of a wider perspective so that I can give better advice that will apply to more people and not just conservatory students. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's really smart. I like, because I, I, the name, we, we, Trevor, our mutual acquaintance now, mm-hmm. uh, emailed me and said, oh, you, you should connect with Alyssa. And I was like, absolutely. And I, I, I like the, yeah, it's a, it's a very well uh, chosen title. So congratulations on that. And Thank it's cool you. because <laughs> you, it really is, uh, just thinking about it from like a marketing perspective, I guess, it's still a niche right or niche mm-hmm. I never know how to say that word it's still like people I don't who, either yeah I hear it both ways I know <laughs> but um but yeah that's uh, it's it's uh it's still pretty drilled down but it's it's you're widening it up a lot more than that like that's a yeah. real limited and you know what what else there's so many people that are thinking about music school but like you were thinking about uh was it neuroscience as well uh yeah yeah there's so many people that yeah. are thinking like that right so so the people that are just like a hundred percent dialed in on on music performance I, I think I think it's a smaller perc- I think a lot of people are in your shoes where they or where they even if they choose yeah. a conservatory they they have other interests that they were maybe thinking about uh, dialing in too yeah <clears throat> no absolutely and that was one of the things that like I didn't even think I was gonna go to a conservatory like I really firmly did not think that's that's where I would end up I didn't think that would be the best fit for me because I really wanted academics in my mm-hmm. life still. Um, and I, by the time I realized that NEC does dual degrees, I had already sent in my application and it was a little too late. Um, but so that was, that was one of the biggest reasons that, I don't know, that like Indiana was really even on the, on the board is because I would be able to get both the conservatory within the university. And I really, really like that. Yeah. The, the beautiful thing is, and as I've learned, as I've gotten older and older and watched people, it's like, it, the good news is it's never too late. And it's a, be- I, I, the thing I've sort of like taken away thinking about school and all that sort of stuff over the years is like, it's a beautiful thing to really pursue what fascinates you and try to just like get to the highest possible level. And that skill, whether it's something you're going to use in an orchestra or teaching academy, that skill will apply to anywhere in life. And, you know, it's interesting. My, my wife came into Northwestern as harp and astronaut astrophysics and quickly said that is, that is too much and let the astrophysics go but came back to it after getting a master's in harp and went ended up going to medical school and that's why we're here in san francisco she's academic radiology at uc san francisco so Sweet. And, and got probably got into the medical school she did because of her unique experiences playing with like lyric opera of chicago and other groups like that yeah. so yeah no absolutely and i think a lot of this a lot of the skills and the traits that make you a really good musician are certainly applicable to any other avenue. And I mean, just the amount of self-discipline that we have to have to sit down and practice and really um, be, you know, critical of ourselves mm-hmm. and I don't know, problem solve, um, I think really lends itself well to any other field, yeah. any other area of study that people want to pursue. 
<laughs> yeah, I've noticed that watching my friends and colleagues that have moved on, not that you should move on from music, we're just thinking <laughs> generally, um, I, I've never seen anybody like not do pretty well at what they decided to do outside yeah. of music. <laughs> and then also, I, I, I've, I've noticed like people who do go all in on music, I know very few people that went all in and didn't end up doing something pretty cool in music. It might not necessarily be playing in the Boston Symphony or, or whatever, sometimes it is, but uh, I, I've, I've gotten more optimistic uh, the older I've, got, I've gotten. And part of that is like watching some of my students who they, you know, just kind of regular, uh, you know, g g dedicated students, but not necessarily someone I would say, you're going to be principal base of yeah. Lyric Opera of Chicago. <laughs> well, one of them is principal base of Lyric Opera of Chicago now and Baltimore Symphony and other spots. So it's, it's amazing what that, you know, just putting that work in and pursuing what you're, you know, what you find fascinating. It's, no, it's amazing absolutely. what it does. Wow. Uh, well, um, I, I'm, I love the uh, pot. Okay. So something I love about doing a podcast and I just so rarely get a chat with somebody who's doing a podcast is it's kind of one of those things that is a good self-improvement project in general. I don't know if you thought about that as well. Maybe you did because you're, you're doing so much on like self care and that kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> and, and so what's your experience been like? I think you're, I have uh, your seven episodes in, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so what's, what has, what's the experience been like? so far actually like putting these th things out in the world oh, man. collecting surveys that kind of thing so I, I've really only been podcasting for I mean, seven episodes so seven weeks mm -hmm. essentially um, which is longer than it seems oh yeah I guess time is not a thing anymore I barely <laughs> remember what day it is right. um, but it definitely no doing episodes like time management doing episodes on like maintaining your health it really is a thing like you got to walk the walk uh cuz you know you can't like preach something and then not do it yourself mm -hmm. but then you're you know kind of a hypocrite and a lot of the people who are listening right now are people who know me personally so they're probably going to be a lot quicker to call me out on like you you say this, but you don't do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely helps me hold myself accountable. Um, and I, it's been, it's been really rewarding. Um, I, I mean, like I said, a lot of the people who are listening are people who are like friends of mine or family members. Um, but even just getting like little text messages from friends being like, hey, I just listened to your last episode. And wow, like, you know, it really gave me something to think about. And I thought about something in a new way or, you know, they took something away from it. And that alone is really rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also kind of stressful I don't want to say stressful it's weird it's a very different experience um putting something out on such a public platform um obviously as a performer that's not necessarily like a new thing but I've I've always done that with bass with an instrument not my voice um and so it's also really weird to sit there and then edit and listen to my voice on repeat <laughs> five times <laughs> um and then you're like, I didn't know I sounded like that. Am I always that annoying? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, overall, it's it's been a really positive experience. And I have plans actually to, to start another podcast soon-ish. Soon-ish. All right. Um, focusing specifically on health, because that's something that I'm super, super passionate about. Um. So yeah, you know, whew. <laughs> it's it's great. No, I love. Well, I'll, I'll I look forward to that second podcast too. But I love. It. I mean, like all your episodes have been good. So congratulations. I was thinking back Thank to you. when I started mine. I was I was probably about ten years older than, or no, even more. Probably I think I was like thirty. So yeah, even more than that when I started. And I felt like I was very nervous putting this out in public, and that I'm also like acutely aware that I didn't know what I was doing. And I love going back. Oh, not, yep. not not that I do this often, but going back and listening to episode one from I think like. 
like the beginning of 2007 and I have all this like electric bass music in there like Apple loops even though it's a it's a double bass podcast you know and and then my second episode I think was just literally me looking at the gear in front of me this like cheesy mid 2000s you know gear that has all left my life and reviewing it and then I think the third episode I was just like talking about some news in the bass world very, very forgettable stuff from 2007 mm-hmm. and then I finally got somebody to chat with but but doing the, uh, these solo uh, chats I think that's the hardest kind of thing to do like I I re- am very reluctant to do that because I again with the the editing and trying to go through are mm-hmm. you are you I'm just this is just I love talking to people who do this sort of thing so are you writing out or are you riffing off the top of your head nope. or I write every single word <laughs> well it's great because it doesn't sound like you're reading so congr- again oh, you're, very, you're very good at this already and and the beautiful thing about doing that kind of editing I like me personally I still say um and ah a lot but I mm-hmm. say it a lot less than I used to because I got so sick of editing out those sounds. I know exactly what a Jason yeah. um looks like in the waveform mm-hmm. and an ah and all that kind of thing. So I think or it's- like all of the uh, <laughs> mouth noises that happen because you have to be so close <laughs> to the microphone and like all the weird yeah. I just the weird mouth noises and yeah yeah that's always fun where you're like ooh. I hope people aren't listening too closely to that. (laughs) (laughs) It's great though, because it's one of those things that like, uh, it there's no downside to getting better at public speaking, which is essentially what I think doing a podcast is. And if, yeah. you, if you can combine anything, I think this, I don't remember where I stole this from some author, but if you can combine anything with public speaking, you are already like a, a oh, niche yeah. within a niche. And, and yeah. it's one of those things that, and as I've done it more and more, and especially since I usually chat with others for the show, um, it's it's been a good way for me to just like frame out quality time with people in my life. Like yeah. like we might it's likely we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we didn't both have a podcast. Although I'd yeah. love to chat with you. I mean, this is great. It'd be great, you know, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to do it again either on podcast or hopefully in person, but the podcast yeah. is just like a nice way to carve out time for what I probably would want to be doing anyway. You know? Yeah. It's it's just a really cool I think of it as like a self-improvement project that just happens to to go out in the public absolutely yeah no i think that's a, a great way to phrase it <laughs> that's yours to use if anybody asks you why you're doing a podcast <laughs> amazing thank you i'll credit you i'll credit you <laughs> well um the it was really interesting to listen to also just you chatting with trevor i'm glad i, I listened to that before and kind of the school decision process and we have, uh, f- have far too many things to ask you but maybe a good one is okay uh what advice would you give Alyssa from one year ago now that you've had a your Ooh. freshman year in what what uh what would you tell her that might be helpful oh i would tell her a lot of things she did a lot of not wise things um specifically to like freshman year or more choosing a school or just anything anything. could certainly be choosing a school or freshman year or whatever Um, i think i was i think similar to what i told uh trevor but like to not stress out about absolutely everything um because i was stressed about everything basically from like my senior year of high school and actually auditioning and applying and you know waiting and doing lessons and school tours and and all of that preparation and then the waiting period and then my whole freshman year i freshman year kind of kicked me in the gut a little bit um And some of that is on me. So another thing that I would tell myself is have some reasonable expectations. Um, Lower lower those expectations a little bit. Uh, Because I think one of the problems I ran into, particularly with freshman year, was I went in with such high expectations of what I thought Uh, school was going to be, how I thought I was going to do, how I thought the community around me was going to, was going to be like. And I think I really kind of set myself up for not failure, but uh, disappointment, I think, because then inevitably when you set such high, just absolutely unattainable expectations, um, you know, you, you let yourself, 
you basically make it inevitable that you'll be let down and disappointed. And that's what happened. And I didn't learn the lesson soon enough. And so my expectations never changed. But then I kept being disappointed and I kept kicking myself for it, thinking it was my fault. So it was a really rough year. It was a rough year. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to my freshman. So I went to Northwestern for uh, undergrad and masters. And it's funny, like those that I remember my freshman year very well, 1994. So going back in time a little while, but you know, like everybody or most people, you know, away from home uh, for the for the first time for me at least, and for an extended period of time, mm-hmm. and thinking about health and that kind of thing, I definitely gained that freshman 15 or whatever. You know, it's like e- eating eating yeah. at the the, the <laughs> cafeterias and and by sophomore year I started to get more into exercise which had a tremendous uh, impact on me and I've gone in phases but I always it always goes better when I'm diligent about exercise and then good food choices kind of come from that because I can't like eat like a pig and go for a long run so it all is hand in hand and I'm you know but uh, so I can't wait to check out your podcast on on that Uh, but but boy I think about uh, I, I had a project a few years ago. I have no idea what possessed me to do, do this, but I went back and I looked at my college transcripts from bachelor's and master's, and I looked at everything I took from every year, and then I looked at everything I'd done in the whatever it is, 20 years or 25 years since then, and I thought about what I've done with those 25 years and what I learned in school and like what I used the most and what I didn't use at all. And it's and so it's it's really that was an interesting exercise for me. So like creative writing. I I had this class my sophomore year that it was so transformative and that that was like i dreaded that class it was really oh, I, yeah. Yeah, um you were talking about soul fetch with trevor you know like like those <laughs> musicianship <laughs> skills that yeah. i so that were such a pain in the neck and i wanted to go practice bass instead and then the practices mm-hmm. will all be full after that class but i ended up using that so much more like sitting at the piano like i so desperately wish my piano chops were better than they are like even still now I, and uh so it's just it's really interesting um when you're in the thick of it and you think oh th- this is gonna you know it, it just is fairly a little bit random but also just kind of interesting what what i've done and i could have done very different things in those 25 mm-hmm. years but like what i got out of college it's it's a uh, it's fascinating yeah no it's it's definitely really interesting like there are a lot of I know people complain a lot about liberal arts classes. Mm-hmm. Um, freshmen at NEC have to take a, a liberal arts seminar, and I got put in um, <laughs> the one that I wanted like the least, and it was called family dramas, mm. which I, I, I'm not a huge play person, and it was the description was like, oh, looking at plays and like analyzing plays using family systems theory which of course at the time I had no idea what family systems theory was I just knew that it involved plays and I didn't want it um and so I went into that class thinking it was going to be the worst thing ever and uh, the things that I've learned in that class are things that I still continue to think about on almost a daily basis so I mean I mean, that's one of the examples that I use of you go into things with an open mind because you never know what you'll take out of it because I anticipated hating that class. And it was my favorite class for semester. Absolute favorite class. Isn't that interesting? Well, and, and so here's an, uh, was do you think it was the the subject matter that ended up being interesting or was it the teacher that kind of like found a a window into that that kind of resonated with you what do you think it was i think it was kind of both Mm. i think the the subject matter so family systems theory um basically looking at like relationships within the family system and you know triangling and different patterns and you know how those relationships form and change and evolve and what happens when they don't um really hit me in a personal way because I was I was dealing with a lot of those things at that time and the teacher was also incredibly engaging so I think it was kind of both the teacher was was really engaging and I really really loved him um and then I I really clicked with the the course and what we were talking about 
you know, I, I'm thinking back, Chad, I'm thinking back to like freshman year, sophomore year, that whole that whole time. And and something I noticed early on in school for me, you know, be, music school. I was at a university, but still, it's a conservatory like environment. You know, yeah. at the music school, and and you know, I felt this intense pressure. It's Friday night. Oh, all these people that are fellow freshmen are in there practicing furiously. You know, <laughs> staying till like a badge of honor. You know, 10 p.m., 11 p.m. And and I started to notice that some people did that, and some people, Chicago, big city like like Boston, in many ways, some people went to the symphony, and some people went out and got out more and saw music, and they were playing. I thought like, and part of me felt like, wow, well, that's like eight hours. They're not practicing over the weekend. I'm going to get those eight hours in. But as I looked at what people did, and I, I, I I haven't scientifically studied this, but I have noticed that the people that went out to see music and to like play on other people's recitals and do stuff like that, they're the people that ended up in Minnesota Orchestra, Chicago Symphony, that and uh, those people that were staying till 10 p.m. I haven't heard about so many of them. You know, yeah. I don't know what your experience has been like, just in terms of because there's. I I just feel at least back when I was in college, there was this intense pressure to like be in oh, that practice absolutely. room. Absolutely, uh, I've definitely felt that pressure. I think there's a lot of uh, different factors that that go into play there. There's a couple that come to mind. Um, I think particularly like at NEC, um, well now too, but uh, the majority of the bass faculty are in the BSO, and so it's it's a really awesome experience to have a lesson and learn from them, and then go see them actually play what they preach, and then you know uh, see excerpts put into context in real time, and you know see these various techniques applied right in front of your face in an orchestra setting versus, you know, isolated in a practice room. Um, and so I, I also think it provides a nice, you get to enjoy music instead of just drilling it and hammering it and, and practicing until you you know, smoke comes out your ears. (laughs) Um, you actually get to sit back and, and enjoy what you're pursuing and I think that's really important and then I also think like spending 10 hours in the practice room while it's incredibly tempting and I think we've all felt the pressure and um I think it's a it's a very slippery slope uh because I think it leads to people being burned out really fast Mm -hmm. because they don't enjoy it as much they don't take the time out to enjoy it they're constantly grinding um and I've been in that position and I've injured myself extensively both times. Um, My freshman year, I was injured the entire year. And like, there were a lot of lessons that I couldn't do. There were a lot of opportunities that I had to turn down because I was in pain like all day, every day. Um, There were like weeks where I couldn't really touch my bass or I could only play for five minutes at a time. So I think it's good to go see the symphony if only for the sake of your physical health, just to take a a step back. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry you went through that. And, and, and like right right off the bat, I, and it, it, those, <laughs> those things are so tough because sometimes, I don't know how it was for you, but sometimes there's not like a, an incredibly clear diagnosis. You know, I'm talking to people, I, I think you mentioned that Susan Hagen, who I I love Susan, she's somebody yeah. you're considering studying with, and and she's had some issues like that. And I've chatted with yeah. many people who, Robin Kesselman, who's principal base of Houston, he couldn't, mm-hmm. he couldn't use his, I think he couldn't use his left arm for like a year, you know. Now he's fine. So those things, the, the, the 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 symptoms are usually some combination of of overuse, stress, poor yep. diet, and exercise, which yep. is why I let you know. And and it, it's so tough because those pressures that you know we're this is a very long game we're playing, you know. And and but there's this pressure. My perspective and and back when I was teaching college, I, I saw this too. You know, everybody's got they're trying to justify their job and you being in their class and putting these pressures. Okay, so now we got to get ready for this jury. You got to get ready for this. You got to get ready. For 
excited for this. There's just all the all these deadlines, whether on yeah. the base or not on the base. Yeah. But but I remember Mike Coker, the j- jazz piano teacher at Northwestern. He, I was taking improv lessons with him, and I was talking about I was all stressed out. What am I going to do after school? And he's he said, you know, Jason, getting out of school might be the best thing that ever happened for you. And he was so <laughs> right. I think he all, has a point. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, like like just just not having those deadlines. I I, I started to practice in a more in a longer with a wider vision and you know one yeah. one last thing on the, on that injury uh thing and health and 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 taking care of your body andres martin my good friend uh, uh lives in mexico he about two years started working out and working with a trainer and he he told him he told me one day he said you know if i had to pick practicing or working out it would be working out uh in terms no, of absolutely yeah. Absolutely. And I was not necessarily of this opinion, um, but I think uh, especially for more petite females um, who play the instrument, it's a physically demanding instrument on its own. And then when you're like, you know, a smaller girl who doesn't have a whole lot of weight to give and put into it, um, I think it's a lot more important than maybe people realize to um, to work those bigger muscle groups so that you have the power so that you're not straining all these little muscle groups. Because there was another point that I was, I had switched to German bow and I was still trying to, you know, figure out how to distribute that weight. How do I get things into the string? And um, one of the things that I, I did because I wasn't I think being super mindful of where I was pulling from um, was I started overcompensating and really playing like tensing my forearm and I showed up to physical therapy one day and my forearm was literally swollen like visibly swollen and she told me she looked at me and she was like if you go and play for the rest of this week I will have your head (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't I was not a very good um patient because I it, it, those same pressures those same deadlines you still want to do everything else that everyone is doing you don't want to take time off um, and I just couldn't get myself to take a step back and let myself heal so I think that's a big part of the reason I kept getting hurt is because I couldn't tell myself it was okay mm-hmm. to step back because I you know it's it's those those pressures the 10 hour grind you want to be in there and i think that's another reason it's really important for young musicians to take their health really seriously it's because it is super bass especially is super physical and music and learning music and performing it um is it's just you have to be so present for it both mentally and physically and you can't do that if your body doesn't function optimally so that's a i think a huge reason that i'm i'm really passionate about like starting a health podcast like geared towards um younger people but also younger musicians Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i think that would be beneficial for a lot of people and there there'll be a lot of uh, I could recommend three dozen guests off the bat if you need guests <laughs> for that because uh, it's a really big you know my friend Sue Wolf who's in the San Diego Symphony mm-hmm. she got a, 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 a wasn't I don't think it was the worst car accident either it was like a maybe a little more than a fender bender but something a few years ago and it just she ended up developing some sort of pinched nerve that just really caused problems yeah. and and it's it's just scary how how those things can happen and and you're so right about the the, and I've, I've chatted about especially adult amateurs that come to base. One of the things they remark on is the you weirdly d- uh, challenging things about the physical nature of the instrument. It's just <laughs> playing something that big. And, you know, you look at professional musicians. There are a lot of violinists and singers mm-hmm. and pianists that really focus on their health and taking care of their health. But, yeah, just the physicality of the instrument is a really um, – it's it's a bigger factor than I think I, I realized when I was – a student absolutely i mean the my instrument is taller than i am <laughs> like it's a it's a huge whew, it's a huge physical undertaking just to carry that thing <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure it's um 
so uh, again, uh, transitioning kind of maybe, but speaking about health, like I, I just, what on earth is it like going into your sophomore year in the middle of a pandemic and lockdown? Like, surely this year went a different direction than you were expecting. So I don't. It's a huge, um, huge. But just like, how are, how are you feeling? How are you dealing with it? Is there any silver line? Just anything you want to share? Because I, my, I feel my heart just goes out to you, just because I think about those college years and how tied up the college experience is with being in person with people and and absolutely yeah so like what just what are your how how are you feeling these days in terms of that I actually I've I've found a lot of positives Mm -hmm. actually um it definitely uh you know (sighs) sucked having my freshman year be a, a giant kick in the gut and then there was this like week week and a half period I had you know um had a huge like I don't want to say breakdown it wasn't a breakdown but sort of a a moment of crisis where I sort of hit a point and I just had to take a step back and was like you got to start putting yourself first and so that's what I, I hit one of those moments where I was like no no you got to start prioritizing your own well-being because I'd forgotten to do that. I think I got so caught up in the college experience that I'd forgotten to do that. Um, and you don't have parents to remind you to do it. So, <laughs> um, but there was like a week and a half period that, you know, I started, I've always been pretty conscious of what I eat. But I started, you know, being more conscious, making an active effort to really eat things that I knew would make me feel better. Um, I started running every day. I started doing yoga and working out and, you know, trying to manage my time better and really mindfully practice for the (laughs) amount of time that I was supposed to. So not for three hours, but for 10 minutes. Um, And I started feeling really, really good about life and school and everything. I was like, the rest of second semester, I'm gonna kick butt, it's gonna be great, I'm feeling like myself again. And then we got sent home. (laughs) And I was like, you've gotta be kidding me. (laughs) Um, So it was definitely, it's been a weird freshman year, (laughs) to say the least. Um, (sighs) Yeah, it's definitely not a um, positive experience being sent home uh, from the place that you've wanted to be and that you've called home for almost a year. Well, not really almost a year, but almost an entire school year. Mm -hmm. I had really considered Boston my home. Um, So it was kind of another punch in the gut to everyone, I think, uh, to then be told, hey, you have like a week to pack up your things and leave. I had to leave my base in Boston. My base is still in Boston, um, which is <laughs> definitely, huh, it's, I have a base here from um, my teacher back home, but you know, it's right. a lot bigger than my base is and it's, <laughs> sure. it's not my base. Right, exactly. um, no, but I'm, I'm very lucky that I even have an instrument to play on. Some people don't. Um, online, conservatory classes are not really the move um online solfege actually wasn't that bad we basically were kind of left to our own devices which i don't mind i think some people in my class really didn't like it um but i didn't mind that online ear training however hmm (laughs) we didn't really do any ear like we didn't have an ear training final or anything like that and uh as someone who is not very good at ear training while it was kind of a blessing so i was like yes don't have to do it also kind of a curse because then i didn't practice it and now i'm kind of behind um and then yeah i don't just the whole thing was really stressful i was really down you know missing everybody, the whole world being in lockdown, the news is depressing and the country's falling apart and uh, being home again in a tiny little house where there's no privacy. <laughs> it was um, a stressful a stressful experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. <laughs> uh, but all of us went through it. Um, 
But I'm very fortunate. I have an incredibly supportive uh, home. Um, my dad has always been very, very supportive. My stepmom has always been incredibly supportive. And they provide me with really what I need to hear. Not what I want to hear, but what I need to hear. And my dad, especially in the beginning, kept telling me, you know, there's a positive in every negative if only you look for it. And it got to a point where I was like, I'm doing the same thing. I'm wallowing. I'm not going outside as much as I should. I'm I'm not eating what I should. I'm emotional eating, mm-hmm. <laughs> which never ends well. Um, and I was just feeling really depressed again. And you know, I w- didn't want to be in that headspace anymore. And my dad was like, now that you're home, I'm not letting you hit that point again. <laughs> um, and so there have actually been a lot of positives. Uh, you know, going back home and kind of having to, to click the reset button and actually look back and reflect and, and really realize you did stop prioritizing your health. You did get so caught up and, you know, it was that you went in with such high expectations and you just, I wasn't kind to myself. And I think being able to reflect and let those lessons hit me um, in a sort of safe place, I guess, um, has been really beneficial because now I know. And now, like, in the format of my podcast, I can make other people aware of those things, too, so that their freshman year isn't, hopefully, a kick in the gut. (laughs) Um, uh, No, but it's also, you know, it's given me more time to really, you know, with base, go back and... uh, take time away when I need it and not feel so pressured and really focus on my foundation and really, you know, be able to dive into the technical nitty gritty and um, focus on playing what I want versus like what's required for some audition that's coming up. Because guess what? No auditions are happening. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So that's been really nice. And, you know, having the opportunity to experiment with different techniques, different, different things. Um, I've been, I've been a, a, a stool player for uh, like two years now because of my, my uh, wrist injury. I started sitting because I, f- I found it a lot easier. I didn't press with my thumb so hard. Um, and so I've been experimenting with standing again, just just for the heck of it, because it'd right. be convenient to not drag a giant wooden stool everywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, having the time to, you know, uh, pursue other avenues, because um, I'm taking a gap year, so I'm not going back because it just, well, I'm not going back this year, I should say. Right. I will be going back. Um But it just doesn't make sense uh, to put myself at risk or put myself at the mercy of of other people, especially living in the dorms. I mean, the flu just rips through the dorms. You think COVID is like COVID's going to be even worse. And uh, my teacher, Don, is is also really nervous about all the unknown variables. And so, you know, I think I'd end up getting Zoom lessons anyways. Right. Right. Um, so I'm actually going to spend this year, um, training as a functional health coach and getting certified for that, which I'm really, really excited for because like functional health is probably the only other thing I've ever possibly considered as a career option. So there are definitely positives if you're willing to look for them. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Well, that that's a that sounds like a great uh, use of your time, particularly given the circumstances. And it might, yeah. it, you know, it's it, it, there's there's always school is always there for you, and 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 that. Uh, 
that seems like and again what do i know I, I went to college a while ago but there's just so much of that in person experience is what college is to me oh, yeah. and if we're if we're just learning online it's like well uh there, there there are a lot of ways to do that maybe i don't need to pay uh you know a, a it's lar- like harvard large... has online courses for free what do i need to pay <laughs> right like right. 70 grand for that like, right no exactly and i i i try i try to be sensitive to all my educator friends out there that are you know in academia trying to make it work, but I think it's a very real uh, thing to think about. And and you know these these schools aren't cheap, even when, no matter what how it works out for you financially, yeah. you're 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 making yeah. an investment. So uh, congratulations, that's great. I um yeah th- this whole I can't wait for your health podcast for me. And you know it's funny how you'd think you'd learn these lessons as you age, but apparently I'm I'm as as foolish as I've ever been because COVID hit, <laughs> and I remember the day I went. I have a gym in our in our condo building that I go to and I, the first day I went and the sign up was closed and I'm like closed great and it was now all gyms have been closed for months and mm-hmm. I think I took two months and didn't exercise I didn't do anything besides like walk to the grocery store and I started to get all anxious start wow. to get cranky stir crazy wasn't sleeping well and like there's a real obvious solution for that Jason get, and, <laughs> and I, I finally started work and I had to like it's like taking time off from practicing I had to like build up again and I, and I finally I just I uh, before we chatted I just came back from a six mile run I did an eight mile run a couple days ago Congrats. but it's it's just like building up any habit you know it's like I started with a one mile run that was yeah. like you know a little tight in my my mid 40s joints you know they were fine but i try to be careful and th- you talking about building up building up good habits like right before covid hit uh i think uh james clear's book atomic habits just hit the bestseller list again for however many weeks and that's such a great book but it's, it's all about just like you know like you were saying do 10 minutes of practice yeah. And then stop. Yeah. And then and then you'll build it up and then you'll do 11. And that and I think we all throw ourselves heroically into these things and injury or frustration results. So it's it's really cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait to follow along with with the current podcast, the future podcast. Um, and you're incredibly well spoken. So you're like the the ultimate podcast. <laughs> guest. So please, let's have this be the first of many. If you'd be if you'd Absolutely. be down. Uh, I'm and, down. OK, anything because we didn't even we didn't even. And this is what I love about this podcast podcast is I, I it's not really about base at all like we talked about base like one percent well yeah <laughs> um where should i send people i've got i've got your instagram and i've got your podcast page on anchor anywhere else you want me to yeah. send people uh not i mean maybe itunes is yep, just something I'll link up to that consider too. college yep. edition yep um yeah other than that i don't know not really <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. And folks, check out her podcast. It's really cool. I love what she's doing right out of the gate like this. I wish I was doing something like that when I was her age. And I love chatting with other podcasters, whether they started out recently or they've been doing it for a long time. It's super interesting. I've actually got several coming up for whatever reason. (laughs) Uh, Maybe just pandemic projects are happening for folks. And so expect to hear more of those. Hopefully those are interesting to you. I certainly have a good time. Thank you so much for listening to this. I get so much out of these conversations there's something that i just enjoy doing and it's it's a good thing for me to do i feel and being able to put it out to you wherever the heck you are whatever the heck you're doing right now is just an added benefit so thank you thank you thank you we got a dog we have a beautiful cute little guy named William four years old chihuahua mix we got from the shelter here in San Francisco and he doesn't really bark which is great so you probably won't be hearing him on the podcast if you follow along with me on YouTube you may very well be seeing some dog bombs in some of my videos but we're working on training him it's a little chaotic around here lots of pee carpet whatever things and chewed up stuff and so we're working on all that but uh, and we're enduring both a heat wave here and it's fire season so it's a a little bit of a chaotic time here on my end. Hopefully you are doing okay or better or managing however things are going for you in these crazy times, that overused phrase. But I appreciate you taking some time out of your day and listening to this podcast. I really appreciate it. 
many, many, many of you have reached out over the years. I'm so thankful. If you haven't and you want to get in touch, uh, uh, just to say hi, even feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com is a great way to do it. And certainly guest suggestions are appreciated. Topic suggestions. I go through and try to reach out to people as best I can. I just sat down last week and went through that list of people that have been recommended and contacted a bunch. So we're going to get some more uh, people from different walks of life, different parts of the music industry, different countries, different life experiences coming soon. And I just want to thank so much the team that puts these together. Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, and Krista Copper. Mitch makes beautiful bases in Kilgore, Texas, east of Dallas-Fort Worth. He's doing great work, award-winning bases, got a silver medal for tone at the last International Society of Bases Convention. So very, very cool. Thank you for listening. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs>